stop what you was waiting for, yo. Everything you do after. The entrepreneur is a gathering. Entrepreneurship is a vessel. Understanding is a resolution of differences. So if you want to resolve and make different, not knowing, you have to know. Now, being a recession proof member, we learn how to do business and start business in the right ways. You can't be a big, gotta be a big tour, man. Motivation. Suck and get on your job if you hate and get on your job. You can look me in my eyes, see I'm ready for whatever. Anything don't kill me, make me better. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, for another episode of Likeable Figures. You're not rocking with your boy, Major Wala, and you know this channel is all about seeing everyday American consumer do better and be better. And today in this episode, another recession proof member, someone I was rocking with super tight. We hit the conference together, we was blowing away by it together in Miami, hacking the <laughs> Yeah, but real deep brother. Like, also a military veteran, had some, some real battles that he had to fight for within himself and he won, he beat him. But I'ma let him tell y'all that because his story is real inspiring. It's going to, once you hear it, you're going to be blown away. I'm talking about from the name to the story, everything. You're going to be blown away once you hear this person talk. A real dope individual, man. I like to introduce my homie, Tay Knowles. Uh, I'm the owner of Capital Elevation Solutions. What up? Tell them people a bit about you, man. What's goody? Um, first of all, Major, like I always tell you, to rock with you is Major, yo. Everything you Straight do, is, you couldn't have a better name. And if you did, if I could be jealous, I'd probably be jealous of you. <laughs> it's, we don't do those things anymore. Yeah, man. So, like Major said, you know, we came up in the RPX family, Recession Pro, where uh, if you know that route, you know, you you was told to go and solve problems, you know. So we added solutions to our name. So Capital Elevation Solutions holds the RPX framework right there in the middle of it. And that was a game changer, you know. Sometimes you, you get tired of playing victim. You get tired of, you know, making excuses for yourself. And you're like, you know what? But I need something that's real. I need something that's practical. And I need something that can help me move forward. It's so much to tell with my story. I, I just, I, I think I need to stick to the script and venture off a little bit. I don't want to venture off too much, you know. Yeah. Um, definitely entrepreneurship is where it's at for me. Straight up. One thing I do want to get into because, and there's a lot of solutions out of there. Like everybody named their business solutions in it. But this cat here, I'm going to let him tell you why this business is capital elevation. Tell him a little bit about that, man. <laughs> well, uh, it was kind of a no-brainer. <laughs> <laughs> I had to call it capital elevation solutions. You know, because elevation is my culture. You know and I mean, um, it's about seeing where I am and seeing what needs to be. And if you think about it in the business sense, it's like having a, um, a SWOT analysis applied to yourself. Yeah. You know, so um, and I've been doing that for so long that I went from the, the name that my parents named me, you know, which is uh, if y'all know me in the rap world or the hip hop world is Taynov L, a flip of what my parents named me, which was Levante. You know what I'm saying? So Tay Nobel is a switch a flip of Levante. So if you know like my grandmother or something, she still say, Hey, Levante, come here, babe. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna have to give you a little backstory to get to the, the name, though. I try to give you the short version, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so I grew up in the United States, so called African American, right? Yeah. Went through a great prestigious school system, you know, A G classes and all of that. Because my grandma said, You better get your education, baby. You better get your education. Cause I didn't get a chance to have that. Do this and do that. So, all right, I listened. So I paid attention to school. The more I pay attention, and the more I start trying to make sense of it, I realized that what I really got out of the end was self hatred. A lot of people don't even know that they hate themselves, and they don't know that what we see around us feed into that. I was always taught to. Then it might come out outright and say this, but from really yeah. paying attention, if uh, and I, I guess it's the flip side of what Jane Elliott said, the, the white lady who be telling people they racist. She yeah. can tell other Caucasians that they're racist. And she's telling them, um, if you're white and you're not racist in the United States, then you wasn't paying attention. Yeah. On the flip side, if you're black and if you, you didn't have an internalized sense of second class citizenship because you kept hearing white was this and white was that, and then, you know, black was secondary. I mean, the way I got that was when they told me that slavery was our foundation. Yeah. Right? That's how they want to start off it, huh? Like, so I started off there. Well, fuck it, then I ain't shit. Mm. 
And when, by the time I got to high school, my motto was, I ain't shit. You know, my parents, my, my father was on drugs. Found out later on, my mother was on drugs. She passed when I was 10, so I was raised by my grandmother. But my mother transitioning when I was 10 made me stronger. I feel like I could be anything after that. With that internalized self-hatred piece, what happens when you tell the people, the people they started out as slaves, don't tell them nothing prior to that, and then they get the narrative that they were saved by coming over here to experience slavery because there's no better life over there on the continent of Africa. Mm. That's the bull crap down. That's the banana in the tailpipe. <laughs> you know, I grew up in the church and started having a whole bunch of questions. If anybody was like me, you got them the responses like, you ain't supposed to question God. Yeah. This is why I challenge you to say to the next person when they give you that answer, when they give you that response, they say, you ain't supposed to question God. Well, when I was studying and reading, it said, ask and you shall receive. Yeah. So, and then when I was looking through Proverbs, it kept talking about the value of knowledge and wisdom and understanding. And the only way to understand is to have your questions answered. So what you mean don't ask no question? And you talking about don't make question sense. God. I'm, I'm questioning you. <laughs> I'm questioning about what you're teaching me about, God. Yeah. So, you know, I'm a father, so I always taught my, my children to be inquisitive and ask questions. And if someone got offended when you ask questions, it's probably because they're not qualified to answer. Exactly. I tell my kids the exact same thing. Anytime a person get mad about you asking a question, either they not qualified or they just don't know. They don't they know. So you right. aggravate them by asking them something that they have no clue. Yes, and that's sir. cool too. Keep it moving. <laughs> yeah, it moving. for real. So anytime I'm building with somebody and they ask questions, I'm like, hey, I'm sorry I keep asking all these questions. I'm like, yo, please ask questions. How else will you get to the understanding? Facts. Uh, Understanding is a resolution of differences. So if you want to resolve and make different not knowing, you have to know. You have to understand. That's that's the opposite of ignorance and not knowing and, and having a misunderstanding. So it's important. So um, <clears throat> by the time I got up to high school, you know, coming up in a uh, predominantly white school system, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go to HBCU. So I, I applied and, and got into North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. I got to tell you that before that, I actually dropped out of high school. I dropped out because I was way too popular and I was being cool is what it was and being smart is what you was trying to hide. You can't be cool back It wasn't cool to be smart back then. Yeah. You feel me? So um, I was like, you know what? I am not taking the school thing serious. So I left there. I went to a, a adult high school at a community college and graduated early. With a, I, I had a 4.0 to the last two months and then it dropped down to a 3.7. So I was I ain't like that because I felt like I really deserved that four point because I had my mom made it up to succeed. Yeah. And so although I I, I thugged it out during the uh public high school by the time I went to that that uh pub, adult high school, I did I did well enough there to be able to get into A and T. And so I went to A and T. I was reading books all over the place by that time. You know what I'm saying? I I would start reading books like From Niggas to Gods, The Miseducation of the Negro by Carter G. Wilson Woodson. Um Dag on the destruction of black civilization. Yo, so many books. Powerful yeah. books. Right. So they put a whole new thing on my mind. So I went from hating myself to realizing that it was a whole narrative that they weren't even trying to teach us in school about us. And it was it, it was they, to their benefit not to. Yeah. If you were in power and you wouldn't want to be a part of the working class. You would have been an entrepreneur. You know what I mean? You would have been wanting to do something for yourself. <laughs> no, but they wanted me to go to school and get, get that education. So you go work for somebody. Yeah. You know? A pipeline. That's yeah. all it is. They like they can't mess their pipeline up. That's how they create employees. I was telling my wife that. She was like, what if everybody just start being entrepreneurs? I said, listen, as long as there's a job out there, you're going to have vast amounts of employees to pick from because they pipeline produce them. Every year when them children graduate, 90% mm -hmm. of those kids are going to be employees to the day that they die. Mm. Hey, it's sad to say, but because they not taught it, they right. not they not taught in school the value of money, how to earn money, financial literacy. They not taught these things. Why you think they keep that stuff hidden away? Because if you learn what they teach you, you're not going to make sense. Once you start learning what they teaching you, yeah. if they teach you that, they going to contradict themselves so they got to hide it away from you and make that knowledge something that you got to attain for yourself and look you know quiet is kept you know you know something about electronics yeah electric circuits so let, let me let me take you there for a minute because i still answered your question 
once you get into the, the this idea of Sankofa, which means to go back and get it, it means the knowledge. You got to go back and get the knowledge from the past so you can understand how to navigate in the future. That's Sankofa. A lot of things get revealed when you go back and see those stories that they didn't teach us in school. And one of the things I learned that was life changing is that remember in, in the church construct, although I never read about a description, a, a description of Adam and Eve as far as hue or, or pigmentation, I, I did have pictures in my Bible and they had Caucasian people in it. And so if you if you take it on face value, it looks like Adam and Eve are the first people on the planet and they're white. Mm-hmm. From the pictures that were in my Bible. Some and people say, I ain't had no pictures in my Bible. I'm like, well, lucky you, because I'm thinking Adam and Eve is white. And then I'm thinking that black people came back, came around as descendants of Ham being cursed with dark skin. Yeah. And my Bible, that's how it was too. So oh, if someone had another Bible. Huh. I don't know which one they was reading because mine was the exact same way. And we didn't go to the same church, so that means that's all. All the, I wasn't in the same state. Not even in the same state. <laughs> <laughs> so and mine was the exact same way, so I don't know. So look, we already touched two elements. We touched on education and we touched on religion. And Dr. Francis Cress Wilson and Dr. Nelly Fuller Jr. said there's different areas of operation or human activity, people activity that's affected infested by and dominated by and ruled by white supremacy. And they said it's uh, economics, education, entertainment, uh, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. So imagine if, if that idea of what, I was, what we just talked about in school has that uh, white first approach. And then religion, that white first approach, and they're saying that's in all these other elements we just mentioned, then you realize that you are in a whole society and and when I when I did the numbers on it, we make up about twelve to thirteen percent in the United States, and I'm talking about black people. But you know, there are other places where we're the, we're the ma- majority. And then when you go outside of this country and you go around the world, you realize that we are the majority, unless you buy into the idea of these man-made borders, these invisible bro- borders, and then you think we're different. You think that brother's Ghanaian, that brother's Jamaican, that sister is Brazilian, but it's all experiencing the same reality. You know what I'm saying? So right. then you, it's like, these are the things that's revealed um, that help me break from the I hate me cycle. And I can't love my brother major if I don't love myself first. And then to dig deeper, dealing with the Adam and the Eve piece, anybody who's who's learned enough in, in, in the world of religion and Christianity know that, that the story of Adam and Eve is a 6,000 year old story. Yeah. And we know that Adam um, that had Eve, old. they had two children, Cain and Abel. Cain slew Abel, went off and made babies and he did not make them with his mother. So where did she come from? Where did that wife come from? <laughs> because this real story was missed. If it come came from this real, yeah. this real story was missed. I guess he, I guess whoever wrote that book was like, you get the point. <laughs> you get the point. You know where they come from. They come from the man's real. I ain't got to keep telling you this. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Thanks. Let me ask you this. Like to switch topics a little bit. If you had to find entrepreneur and entrepreneurship, how would you define it? The entrepreneur is the captain. Entrepreneurship is a vessel. It's a ship. Thanks. You know what I'm saying? So uh, you're the person who has the mind to steer the helm of the ship without going ashore. without That's perfect. <laughs> without bumping into another ship. You know, and, and I'm a Navy veteran. So in the Navy, a captain can lose his, his whole career if they went sh- to shallow waters. Where, yeah. they was, where they couldn't continue to move out. You losing your job, homie. <laughs> you know, so entrepreneurship is your ability to navigate those waters. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Using further Navy terms, it, it might involve you to have to, um, if, if you really want to scale it and do it right, and thinking about that book, Who Not How, to have you to get you a team, right? There's a term that I, I was going to mention with the Navy, it's called watertight integrity which means you're tight knit. It's a well-oiled machine. If, if a ship doesn't have watertight integrity, the water will get into the ship, the ship will sink. You know, So you have to find those things that can sink your ship and make sure it's, it's watertight integrity there. That's when you would analyze your systems. If there are systems, if they're not, you might want to get some. You know, But um, that still goes back to the, your original question. I'm going to go ahead and answer it. You said the name so of my company, Capital Elevation Solutions, which stems from my name, which I changed from Levante to act constant elevation and constant elevation again uh, constant means to be steadfast and faithful and elevation means to take off to take flight to rise above 
You know what I'm saying? So if you're constantly elevating, there's no stagnation. Right. And so like this is why, you know, being centered on that, I have a, a, a weekly call called All Things Elevation. Yeah. And we might we might touch any area of human activity. It might be uh principles. Like one day we talked about jealousy and envy. Another time we talked about um growing foods and being self sufficient. Another time um we had LaDonica come on and she was talking about entrepreneurship, you know, so yeah, we Major gonna be on there, watch. He yeah. gonna be the next person yeah. on there. So, so yeah, so um elevation is what it is and entrepreneurship is where it's at right now. So what type of business is constantly elevated solution, first of all? Well, let, let me let me tell you the difference between now starting a business versus when I started it before. Okay. Now, being a recession-proof member, we learn how to do business and start businesses the right way. So now we have boxes to check off to make sure that we, we are sound so that we can get future funding. You know what I mean? So that we're credit worthy. And I didn't know that before. At first, I just thought you'd get an LLC and an EIN. Yeah, definitely a business plan. Because I knew about the SBA, I knew about the um, score, service core of retired execs. I knew th- about those things, but I didn't have a blueprint. So now um, having a blueprint, it's like, all right, boom. Now I know that certain things need to be lined up, you know, and I can move in confidence. I'm more confident now. And so when you know you have a foundation that's secure, because we're not learning from somebody who's, who's winking it or who's just, who had guessed at it. They proved, they proved and stood the test, test of time and then brought it to us. Yeah. So I have security and confidence in that. Mm. You feel me? So that's the difference between now and before, you know, and then we have a family. Like Major, I didn't grow up with a brother, but that's my brother. Like that's my brother. There's love, respect, and admiration there, straight up. Thanks. Same on this side, bro. Same on this side. So when you started your business out, what inspired your idea? Like what problem did you set out to solve when you started your business? I wanted to solve my own problem and be more financially stable myself. And a lot of people learn about RPX or Recession Proof by way of seeing um, him 500 on social media. And so I saw something maybe two, two, almost three years ago, early in the year of 2020. And I'm like, yo, man, what is dude talking about? Yo, I ain't never heard nobody talking about this much swag. Man, bro, I promise <laughs> I ain't trying to cut you off, bro. Both bro. All of, we said the same exact thing. Bro, I ain't never heard no nigga talking like what, this. What are you doing? What's going on? <laughs> let me, let me, let me see if this, cause, cause I'm not no fool. Like I don't just go for nothing. Yeah. I said, man, I'm. I tune in and I said, I'm gonna give it some time to see if if, if it's a fluff, cause it, it's gonna fall off if it ain't real. Yeah. Same six man. months later, at first, and I called, and it was like, yeah, it's this amount of money. I'm like. I think about five grand back then. That's how much you were. That's how much you were. Yeah, I think I put five. So I was like, well, first of all, you know, it obviously ain't for me because I don't have five grand to throw at nobody. Yeah. But I still couldn't help with paying attention. I kept paying attention to him. And then uh, I said, you know what? I'm going to invest. It's not a purchase. This is an investment. And I'm going to invest in this. And that's me investing in my future because somebody somebody might get into it and then just be there. But yeah. I want to take something away from it. And I want to build something up. I don't know if I if I completely answered your question, but definitely the idea of making an investment, getting something that's practical. I said, you know what? Like who doesn't need a credit repair? If if 81% of all credit scores and credit reports are jacked up, then all my friends could be credit rep- repair specialists with their own business and we wouldn't step on each other's toes. Yeah. It don't stop. A credit score is something you gotta manage. Bro, if you were talking to me back in the day, I would I thought. A credit score was something you have, and then that's your credit score. Like, <laughs> I didn't know, like, bird, it can change every month. Yes. Every 30 day cycle, it can change. There isn't a person that don't know if they got a good credit score. You know that? If you got a good credit score, you're going to know it because you <laughs> constantly have to manage your credit. Like, yes, if sir. you don't know if you got a good, like, nine times out of 10, you got an average to below average. Be trash. <laughs> I like, I like, I like when they have clients with low scores. And I tell them, look, don't worry. This is going to be a beautiful journey. Yeah. And look where you are now and, and go and take a picture, a screenshot of where you're at. Take your score, screenshot it, and watch what happens. Exactly. But the one thing about it, you got to be willing to take the journey. Mm-hmm. They, you got to be willing. You'll be surprised how many people I have to turn away all off telling them you're not going to qualify with what it takes to do it. Like, because you thinking there is a quick fix. And if you take a quick fix, yeah, you probably can get it done in a quick way, true enough. 
But if you don't change within your process of changing yourself, bro, you just going to keep recycling the bad credit score. Like you just going to keep because you're not changing your habit. That number reflects the type of financial habits that you have. They ain't got to discriminate against you no more because you black or white or Asian or Mexican. No, that number. Once they check that number, it tells them a story about you. And once they can go back and look at your past, and, hey, what is payment history looking like? Your payment history, no, it don't matter if you black. I'm not, I ain't doing this because I'm racist. I'm right. doing this because I'm looking at your score and I see I ain't going to get my money back. You see so what I'm saying? So you just hit on something really big because oftentimes, you know, especially people in our community, they like, well, I didn't learn that in the house. My parents didn't teach me that. Mm. But check it out. What Major was just talking about was the change in credit industry. Like in 1989, that's when the FICO came out, Fair Isaac Company, yeah. which made the criteria change where you now have to look at those those points you were just talking about versus back in the day. they like, Hmm. You ain't even in this club, homie. You, yeah, you, you, exactly. Yeah. That's why they changed it. That's why yeah. they came out with the system because yeah. it was so many. It was an uproar of, oh, this person denied me. They didn't want me because I'm black. But now it's a lot of people focusing on the race thing. But bro, it's it's more of a private thing. Mm -hmm. People that's in private because there it could be a white person mm -hmm. that can be. Living in that same project that you're living in, or mm -hmm. the same slums that you're living in, they go apply for something. If they credit is bad, guess what? They're going to get denied too. I promise you. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Because it's showing that I don't care because you car K, you can check that box all you want. Like your payment history, your number is showing me that I can't depend on you to repay these payments on time. I tell all my clients, man, you write your story so. Be sure that you're getting things that you can handle to be in your book, right? Because your story is being written every day. So you go out there, you go out there, and you get approved for everything. True enough, because you just starting out. So they they approve you. Now you're going to determine on how that book started out. It could start off as devastation, like right? because I ain't gonna understand. Mine started off as devastation, right? by that social security number, but it's the reason they gave it to you at birth. <laughs> and stuff follow you forever on with that thing, man. Thanks to those snitches. I refer to them, them folks from secondaries as snitches. Yeah, yeah. They, just, they just follow you around as we know you all. I had a client, listen, she had a wrongful eviction. A wrongful eviction on her credit report. Got the eviction, took it off, everything. Got court documents from the court stating that this eviction is wrongful. So Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian, they took it off. But guess who? You know who didn't? Them secondary bureaus. Because that's they, that's their business model. Their business model is to house data. So rather if you if you got to expunge, yeah, you got to expunge from your record, but it's still part of your record. They they got to show the expungement papers too. So if someone pulls your record, they got to see the court document saying that your eviction was expunged. True enough. Mm -hmm. But they're going to see your entire record. So they're going to see the eviction was on them. And that's sometimes, that's all that matters. They just mm -hmm. seeing that you had an eviction, no matter if it's wrong for or not. And that's mm -hmm. what she was dealing with. Till we got up, till we opted out and told yep. them stop sharing the information. But let me ask you this, man. Sure. Since you started your business from the time that you was an employee to the time you became an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. have your priorities changed in it? And if so, how how did they change? Yeah, because just like how the, the five grand was an investment, now you got to invest time. Yeah. Time is one of those things you can't get back. So my routine had to change thanks to me seeking out information to help me prioritize how to be a better entrepreneur. So I learned about the savers, which is uh, my, my routine that, that I implement in my day. Silence, affirmations, visualizations, exercise, um, reading, and scribing. But also, one of the first things they have to do is allocate, allocate a certain amount of time to the business. Every day. Every day. It's now a priority. I knew from building businesses in the past that, um, like I, I told my son, same thing right now, that I applied to, to the business. I applied to him. Yo, your room will be shitty unless you pick tidy it up every day. Don't let it accumulate. So same thing. Your, your work, the, the mountain of a business that you want to build ain't so big if you just do little things every day. Right. A big thing is a whole bunch of just small things put together. Thanks. Right. Yeah, so just a little bit every day um, towards the business, whereas before the business, I didn't have to prioritize or add that to my routine. And then when you when you get a little momentum, it makes you want to put more time towards it because you see that the work is paying off. Yeah. That part. Hey, 
You see that snowball building up, and then now you want to. That's all you want to do because you see you got motion. When once you get motion and everything go to clicking, listen. That's when you gotta start. Like especially if you got a family, like you got a wife and kids, because listen, bro. When you growing something that's yours. And you see that thing you gonna start to growing and it catching track. Like man, you'll shut, you'll be shut out from the world. Like I'll just focus on growing that you, you hell bent on growing it because you see that it is growing. And now you ain't got that balance of being the father that you're supposed to be or being the husband that you're supposed to be. Seeing that business snowfall and be bigger, it's a beautiful sight. I promise you, it is. And then people ain't gonna believe in you at all around you, especially your loved ones, until they see it, the evidence. Facts. All right, so you've been doing your business for how long, would you say? About to be three years. Okay, three years. Facts. So you made a lot of mistakes along this way. A lot of things that you knew, like, damn, I, if I had a chance to do that over, mm -hmm. I'd do it different. What are some of those things that you, if you could start from the beginning, that you would do differently than what you did this time around? Mm. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I would have sat down and went through that whole RPX course more, sp spent more time towards that. I still go back and review. It's just so much, bro. Mm -hmm. It's so much in there. And and I know now you don't want to like shoot, shoot, shoot in all these different directions. Focus on your one thing, you know, mm -hmm. and strive to be the best knower of that. I wish I would have done that earlier. And then as far as actual credit repair, at first I would um have them opt out, right? And then change the, you know, the, the personal information yeah. and then wait for them to complete certain steps before I start uh, disputing. That's not, I found that that wasn't wise because they still looking at you like, what you, what you going to do? Yeah. You know, so that was one thing. Um, I would have taken more advantage of the relationships and leverage the relationships from the RPX family sooner and, and held on to them tighter, you know, because we started with a strong crew in the beginning. And I don't talk to all of them anymore. Yeah. I ain't going to say I talk to them on you know, everyday basis, but for his communication, I still got an open line of communication. For his reaching out, checking in, whatever, like I, I would say it's still cordial. Yeah, I got, I got a faithful few. One thing I know, bro, is the power of um, networking. And, and I know that the most important things in life aren't things. It's, yeah. it's these relationships that we have and we build and we, you know, breathe, you know, give life to one, speak life to one another, give each other alley-oops or whatnot and, and yeah. go from there. I understand how important they are. And what else? There was one more thing. If I could do it different, I would have gotten a, um, a virtual assistant a lot earlier. That, that, was, a game, <laughs> that was a game changer. Facts. It sure yeah. was for me too. Mine, I got two right now. And they they be on it. They I got to ask, what country did you have your virtual assistants in? Oh, uh, India. Oh, wow. Okay. India. What's crazy yep. is um, mine are in the Philippines. No. And I've been there before. Sometimes we speak English. Sometimes we speak Tagalog. Facts. Oh, so cool. you know how to talk to them. Yes, sir. I'm going to keep it a band. That networking piece was so vital that I utilized it right there with my virtual assistant. Mm -hmm. Now he called me brother. He's like, yo, when you come into the Philippines, no. you know, he, 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 he teach me new words so I can add on to my vocabulary. The last one I learned was ta-da, which means let's go. Every time yeah. we make a move, it's let's fucking go. Ta-da. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> so that was the last word I learned. But um, yeah, so now he actually does more than we, he's contracted to do. Yeah. Oh. Every day. He's a Filipino uh, rap artist. So he he know my music. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He's like, he's like, brother, brother, you are so amazing. Like, I want to be like you. So, <laughs> and it was important for me to build a rapport because I'm putting, I'm trusting him with my clients. I, I literally love my clients like they're my family. Yeah. For uh, real, I, I, they report like this, like it's my report. Like, I don't, I they came to me because they tired of going to the next person who promised them things but left them with nothing. That's part of my onboarding. When I have an onboarding call with them, I tell them, I know you tired of hearing a person promise you the world and don't deliver. I know you tired because I see it too often. I see people, man, I tell them all the time, one thing about it, I'm not going to bullshit you. I'm not. I'm going to be straight up with you. And I ain't going to tell you that, like, on no, on no too good to be true type stuff. Like, too good to be true. Like, a person telling they can delete anything. I tell any person, man, you hear a person talking like that, just know you need to 
reevaluate because some things don't need to be deleted. Some things just need to be updated. You know? Man, listen, I'm going to tell you what's up. I had a client. She was going to get a house. Bro, you will be surprised on how how impactful a hundred word statement is. People that's approving your application, when they see your side of the story, they take more heed to it than just seeing a, a late payment right there. Mm. So the hundred word statement, it works. What What are some obstacles that you had to overcome when you first started out in your entrepreneurship journey? Thinking that I could hire some people I knew. <laughs> Yeah, family members. Yeah. People was like, yo, they, they they smart or they get it. They got to go get it in them. And then I, I trained one sister from out of Texas and she had access to my to my, CR, to my, uh, my, my CRM. You know what I'm saying? She, you know, everything. And then just disappeared. I said, why you go through all that? Just to do that. <laughs> and it happened to me about two or three times. I'm like, you know what? You got to go with people that are like, because I found out when you hire those VAs, they not just working for you. You know what I'm saying? They have other companies that they working for at the same right. other small business owners that they hire them also. So, like, they very accustomed of to being, like, professional and actually handling things the way that you want them to handle it. If you send mm-hmm. them a SOP of how to do something, Bro, they going to do exactly how you sent it to them. And if they can't do it, man, they reach out to you. Mm-hmm. They reach out to you and let you know that, hey, well, this can't happen like this because of this problem. And now now you got to become the entrepreneur that you say you want to be. You got to solve the problem. Yes, sir. So that, hey, that's why I look at it anyways. Entrepreneurship, that's, you got to be a problem solver. Oh, day long. Yes, sir. Got to, man. Entrepreneurship, you won't punch in and punch out. Like, oftentimes, when you have a job, you know, whatever's at home, you leave it at home. You come here, you think about work. Entrepreneurship, you don't turn it off because you you might hit something in the middle of the night. And now this is your ship that you're steering in the direction that it's going. And if it was someone else's, you might not even feel the need to put your all in all into it. This is different. Now you got to put your energy towards. Um, and I think it's always best to know that you're always under construction and know that there's always something that you can add, mathematics, that you can always add one to any number. Yeah. So it's like, what direction can I take it in? Or who do I need to meet to add on and take me in a new direction or to, to help me facilitate you know, new ideas? So I like to get in spaces with people who um, are, are further along, you know what I mean? And, and it might not even be my field, but and, and just glean from them and, and pull something. And entrepreneurship, I think, really is about being a student in life. Mm-hmm. Because you'll be able to take things, when you're look, seeking to learn, and the universe is your university, then you're taking lessons from all around, looking for solutions and everything that will spill out into your business. Hey, if you have a question, and you think on that question so long, man, you'll be surprised on how those answers come to you. Sometimes they come in a form of a book. Sometimes it's a form of a conversation that you may have with a random person. But if you have a question and you dwell on that question for a length of time, trust and believe, bro, that Eta will give you the answer to that question, to that problem. But it's about being aware. You got to be aware to know when the answer is being presented to you. The answer could be right there in front of your face. But if you're not aware that it's there, you're not going to get it. And when it comes to answers too, um, bro, you can't be profane. What do I mean by that? If you want the answers, if you if you want answers to any question, I don't care if it's entrepreneurship, spirituality, relationships, <clears throat> you have to remove a profane way of thinking, profanity. And the profanity I'm talking about is that C A N apostrophe T. Oh, if you got, can't, that's the biggest bad word in the vocabulary. Man, that's a victim now. Victim. You if can't be a I, victim. You gotta be a victor, man. <laughs> right. Anytime you can you can actually fix your lips to say can't, then it's like you you might as well put some little boy bloomers on. Yep. Uh, you ain't got your big yep. boy pants. You, you're not you're not ready to be an adult. You're not it, ready to be a father. You're not ready to be a husband. You're not ready to be an entrepreneur. You know what they say in the military: excuses are tools of the incompetent. If they're yeah. monumental, nothing. And those who choose to use them are seldom good at anything else. So you don't want to be that guy. But as soon as you use a word like that, I promise you, it it puts your mind into limited belief immediately. Like it me as soon as you think in that way. You so see? they made me think about in school when the teacher asked a question and say, "Raise your hand." And you're about, to raise, about ready to raise your hand and somebody blurt out the answer. Yeah. Then your mind shut down. So sometimes we have people around us who blurt out the answer of, I can't. 
and you take that and don't even try to answer it after that because they said that they can't, so now you think you can't. But what happens if they blurt out the answer and the answer is wrong? Mm. E- even if they come up with an answer, what if you have an alternative answer? Exactly. See, and that, that that's entrepreneurship. Like right now, we're in the age of regurgitation. Mm. Entrepreneurship requires that you step from the age of regurgitation and venture into the age of innovation to think of answers that aren't already there. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Someone got to be the first one. Why not you? Why That's not how you? I think about it. Like you said, there's innovative, groundbreaking individuals in every industry. You look at them like they like they are like they geniuses. But you know, most most people that you recognize as innovators, don't you know they got the answers for someone else that didn't know what to do with it? It's the person that's trying to be an innovator, is who you're gonna remember. And look, and, and when you when you start out doing your thing. Don't think that means you're going to get it right on the first try, yo. Like, no, some of us bumped no. our heads, we fell, scuffed up our knees. Think about, I mean, the old analogy of a baby trying to learn how to walk. How many times that baby fall before he or she finally gets it right? You know, and now that you run and don't even think about the struggle that you had learning how to walk. Man, listen, failure is part of the journey. Please There's no that. such thing as a straight line. Mm. It's always going to be duck, dodge, going around things, and it ain't always going to be pretty. But yeah. can you stay focused enough, long enough to get it accomplished? Because you said that you was going to do it. Simple as that. If and you if, remove, if you if you remove the profane, because he said, "Can you?" You have now, to know in your mind, "I can." I might not know how to get. For example, take it back. When I when I was diagnosed with cancer, bro, I didn't know what it was. I ain't never been through that before. I just knew I was going to beat it. It was like the like going around a, a, a windy staircase, not knowing what's around, just knowing that you're willing to keep stepping. You exactly. know what I'm saying? Like, you don't even know how to fight that. Like, I don't think you just knew. You said it in your mind. I don't know what it is or how it is, but I know I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. You know what I'm saying? Because it's got to be done. Be a dog if this is what I'm going to do. Like, you can't feel sorry for yourself. Mm. If you feel sorry for yourself, it's going to doubt going to creep in. Mm-hmm. Because you're in a low vibration. Raise your vibration and you feel like a can-do mindset. Bird, bird, the same way the mind can make you sick, the mind can heal the body. Anybody who, who's hearing our voices, if you have a loved one or someone you care about or it might be you who has been diagnosed with cancer, someone who has cancer, holler at me. Mm-hmm. There's a cure, but not in allopathic medicine, not in the Western medicine. Even if they give you stage four diagnosis t- until you have you, you have six months to live, they, that's true according to their approach. That's not the, 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 the game breaker. Like there's other ways other than what they're taught. Hey, living testimony, man. And let's, let's, let's break it down real easy. Have you ever ate food and felt tired? Have you ever ate food and felt energized? Something else. Yeah. Therefore, everything you put in your body has an effect on your body. How do you want to feel? What quality of your life did you want? You know, we were taught to eat according to what tastes good to our tongue instead of the outcome that the food has on our body. Yeah. So your whole approach is wrong. If, if you if you wise and you know how powerful and, and creative we are, we can take the thing that's actually good for the body and make it taste good to the tongue. Mm-hmm. Quality and of life. That's why a newborn baby has more bitter receptors on their tongue than an adult. Taste what well, a baby will eat a whole bowl or something, but if you taste it, it's like man, I don't see how I don't see how this baby eating it because on the baby's tongue got more bitter receptors, and bitters are better for your gut. Man, listen. When I realized my old lady told me this, and I. I was arguing her down on this because I did not believe it. Man, you're supposed to have a bowel movement at least three to four times a day. <laughs> and I'm, I'm thinking, I'm like, man, get the fuck out of here, man. <laughs> I don't know, like, bro, I'm like, bro, no, man. So you ain't telling them that fuck though? Because I, like, I understand it's some days you might do it, like, but not every day. I ain't, but when I look at babies, when you think about babies, when they you think go. about dogs, they go. Like, they have those many bowel movements a day. Uh, and you and you urinate that many times a day. So your bladder is working good. So if you're not boo-booing three to four times a day, that something wrong with your gut. And blockage. Yeah. That hey man, that blew me. That blew my mind, man. Cause that had me there. I was like, bro, I gotta go. I gotta go the whole straight water die David phase, man. Yo, so I'm 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 gonna drop a few uh jewels for those who may go through cancer or those who might have any other ailments. Yeah. One one thing I tell the folks to do is, if you want to live and beat cancer, you have to eliminate meat. 
Meat mm. is is it's dense. It's hard. You have to chew it to get through it. So guess what happens? For your body to digest, it takes a lot of energy. It's easier to digest applesauce than it is the steak. The energy that you you need to have, you know, put towards your healing. Now you got to put towards you know trying to break down these dense foods, and the stomach is so long to get through that. Yeah, I mean, like you really you killing yourself eating. There's a book called Nutricide, um, subtitled "The Nutritional Destruction of the Black Race." Man, when you when you think about these things and you become conscious of them, that's when you become ignorant. If you know better and you still still decides to do what's wrong, bro, you got to want to conserve life, bro. Mm. Live life to the fullest and be the best version of you that you want to be. Mm. And the best version of you is a healthy use. The body is a, is a hell of a thing, man. The things that it can do, we regenerate. Like you can cut yourself and you will regenerate more skin over that cut. So if we can do all those things without us even making it do it, does it by itself. It can handle you having, uh, just say if you want to go have a, a fucking burger every now and then. Burr, I ain't saying that that's going to take you out, but I'm going to tell you one thing, overindulging, if you overindulge on anything, I guarantee you it's going to, like that one thing will take you out. When I realized that food is a thing, sometimes in grocery stores they have food stuff, meaning food, stuff that you can eat in the form of food that really got a whole bunch of different ingredients. If something is watermelon juice, it should say watermelon juice. It shouldn't say these six and seven syllable words on top of words, on top of words, on top of words. That means it's laboratory. And, you know, so what I'm getting at is uh, like when, when we begin to want a better quality of life, then you're going to look at what you're putting in your body. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, imagine this. I had a thought today when I was talking to do. I'm like, yo, we must think that these people who we buy food from in these grocery stores love us. We must think they love us. We don't need. Do you know who grow your food? Do you know where your food come from? I you don't you even think know. to ask questions. You don't even know these people. Like, I've never met anybody who, I like, the people, when I go to the grocery store and buy food, where did that come from? Who made it? Who is, who is the person? Like, think about this, man. I right, just say if you grow an orange tree, an orange tree or apple tree, you see how long that it takes for that apple, for it to go become from a seed to a tree where you can pick a fruit from it. All right, that's a long, that's a process. However long it may take, it's a process, a gestation period that it takes from the time it's a seed to the time it's a, a tree that you can pull out by for. You only can get an apple from a tree a certain type of time of a year. It's not something that you can do year round. Do you think that all those apples and fruits are real pick from tree apples and fruit? When you think about that, man, like you just know, like, where it can't be, just like you say. GMO. When you look on a bag of apples, it, the ingredients should be apple seeds. Thing is though, like how far removed are we from having stuff of our own? Like, do we not think that, that if, if you have grass and ground around you, that it won't grow food? Like, <laughs> nah, because they tell them. You know, they tell people they like when you hear people saying like this, Florida, Florida orange. So in in a regular everyday mind, you don't think Florida. that. Yeah. I'm not in Florida, so I can't grow orange. Yeah. You know? So they'll yeah. tell you, Macintosh apple, Idaho potato. So you'll think that you can't, oh, ain't no, ain't no potatoes in Alabama. Like, bro, if it's soil, you can grow this shit anywhere. And we, we gave it to them earlier. If you yeah. ain't in Florida and you somewhere else, don't use that profane word, can't. You can't say that. Like you, uh, Exactly. You are not your own. Exactly. I, I know, like, for example, I know um, a sister from Liberia, uh, shout out to African Pearl, Mama Africa. She bought Moringa seeds from Liberia. It had a certain climate. It said it was supposed to grow in Africa and in India. She bought them in Smithfield, North Carolina, and, and, and we had a whole farm. I was helping her out there, her farm, growing Moringa seeds. She ended up, you know, uh, taking the leaves, drying the leaves, crushing the leaves, making a whole product and putting it in the store. Mm -hmm. the industry from the ground. Make them right. So, like, for example, they got you following that food pyramid, but that don't apply to you. Because you, as, a, as a melanated, melanin-dominant person, you require you have different requirements. Mm. And most of us, uh, because of the melanin dominance, are lactose intolerant. Most most people who like... Uh, I am. You know what I mean? So am I. And, uh, you know, they're more susceptible to osteoporosis. So, like, chemically, it's a little different. We all have, you know, a physical body. 
but the world affects it different. I don't go outside and burn. Yeah, you can get vitamin D from the sun, man. The cow is getting its vitamin D from the grass. The grass is getting the vitamin D from the sun. So why I got to get it from the cow? <laughs> like if the grass getting it from the sun, bird, well, I'm just getting mine from the sun too. But they tell you, hey, oh, drinking milk make you have strong body, strong muscles. But they don't tell you about the RBGH becoming a bovine growth hormone that, yeah. that gets cancer. That they say because of that, which they say one out of three people who drink milk or dairy products will get cancer Dang. because of to the point where they don't stop putting it in there. But what they will do is identify on the cartons that don't have the uh, hormone in it. Our milk has uh, pus, like cow pus in it. The FDA, Food and Drug Administration. They put those labels on the box to make you think that those people are keeping you safe. No. Only thing that they put on the box, they saying it can't be above a certain level. They not saying it can't be there at all. They just saying it can't be there. It can't be above a certain level. What if that level, if it's under that level, but it's still harmful to you? And that's why some products uh, that you put on your skin and in your body are banned in other countries, but they're not banned here. Mm -hmm. Oh, they made totally different. Or oh, they taste so it could be the same product, eat a Hershey chocolate here. Then I was in Amsterdam. Okay. I went to Amsterdam, had the same type of Hershey bar over there. Totally different. You know, talking to the oncologist with cancer, they say one of the first things you would also want to eliminate is white sugar and caffeine. Mm -hmm. Cancer loves white sugar and caffeine. You eliminate those too when you want to battle cancer. Just side yeah. bar. Back now, that like, bro, that's pocket this episode can be an episode of straight nutritional <laughs> food journey bro like for real because we got to be well-rounded individuals and this is something that's very important for our culture because it's things that, that we don't think about be balanced if you take care of your body your body will take care of you because the body will evolve with the surroundings of what you're living in. Like you just said, cancer loves these things. If it's in a body that it can thrive in, oh, that's where it's going to stay. There but you if you are taking care of yourself, you make sure that you can go to the gym or get up and be active. Take care of your body. And you're, like you say, man, like, listen, and you're like, man, I got people. I'm, I'm at this age. They, they see, think I'm 19 years old. <laughs> Because when you take care of yourself, bro, yeah. you going to see, bro, your skin, gonna, you're going to glow. Mm. You're going to have a glow to yourself. Mm. I take the, the chlorophyll drop. Yeah, yeah. You see what I'm saying? Like, bro, just doing a sea mouse, laterate, mm. elderberry, things that will keep your immune system up, keep you having the energy to go on, keep your, you know what I'm saying, keep your youth, keep your youthful, man. It's a, like it's things out here that you can take care of your body with. Yeah, one of them is water. Yeah, most certain, certain coaches they put you on the water fast for you to help heal your body. As a yeah, foundation. yeah. I, I like I, I I do basically. I'm gonna say, and it, it this is just me. Like I would say, I do intermittent fasting every single day because. I'm a type of person, I cannot eat breakfast. I cannot, I don't see how people eat at 8, 9 o'clock in the morning. Like, even at that time, bro, I, I I wake up, I go to the gym in the morning, go to the gym, work, bro, I, can, I, I be eating around, I want to say around 11, 30, 12 o'clock every, like, most days, I ain't going to say every day because that will be me lying, but most days, bro, I, I only eat one whole like full meal most days. Like most days, that's all I eat because I don't know if I train myself that way or what, but bro, that's all I can handle. I don't see how they can tell people they need to be eating three times a day. Like, remember, bro, remember like every, time, every time you eat food, depending upon how dense the food is, you over, you work, you make your body work to break it down. Yeah. So if you only eat one meal a day, you have less energy put towards breaking food down. So, so if you take the time to put, like, knowing how the food affects your body and you're doing it one meal a day and you hydrating. Yeah. Constantly drinking, drinking water. water. Gatorade. Like, water with pH in it, like, with a, with a nice like, pH balance yeah. in it. You know what I'm saying? Like, at least bowl seven. Mm -hmm. Like, um, if you don't, if it's ill, just water, put a lemon in it just to get you some. 
peroic acid inside your water to to help break down your food that you do got in your stomach. Like, and then and like like I say, bro, I ain't no expert at this. Like these just things that I pick up. It. You know what I'm saying? Just pick up hearing people that is talking about it. Like that, like shit, it can't hurt. Yo, you know what I'm saying? It can't hurt. Like, people be like, ain't no such thing as a perfect person. And I'm not saying it is, but what I will say is that perfection is to constantly grow, which means you just keep making small changes exactly. over the course of time and things get more refined for you. You, you get you get better at certain things. You, you make the changes. You learn things small steps at a time. And then you mess around and be a whole greater person than what you were 10 years ago, just from doing right. that. Further along and everything. Better right. quality of, of relationships and friendships. Oh, no. Facts, man. And you'll see the growth within yourself. People see you. Me and Mole, we was having that conversation last night. I was telling them, like, listen, when you elevate within yourself, when you elevate and your energy change, your freak and you vibrating on a higher frequency, it's people that you that you rock with way back in the gap. When you around those people, it's going to feel like like, like your body's going to the energy, the frequency going to let you know that. What they got going on and what you got going on don't mix. You need to remove yourself. Everything around you be the first thing to let you know when you're in that type of situation. It ain't, and it ain't even that you think you're better than them. It's just that you know you deserve the fruits of being focused on what you're doing. And if they're not rocking with that, they can only slow you down. Facts. And, and some people, because of where they at in that, you can't always encourage them. You just got to pick and choose your battles wisely. Facts. I agree. Man, I want to thank you for coming on with me tonight, man, once again. And there was another episode of Lockable Figures. My name is Major Wala. This is my homie, Constant Elevation. So, uh, Tay No, check him out. I'm going to drop all his social links in the description. Make sure y'all go check in with him. He have a call every Monday. Every Monday night, we got a Zoom call for all things Elevation. And every Wednesday... I have a podcast with three other brothers, Brother Chris, Brother Putu, and Brother Sam. It's the Pan-African Party podcast. And we've had some some heavy hitters on there from all over the world, bro, talking about us working together globally. Thanks. So I'm going to drop all the links in the description. If you get a chance, go check them out. And because you know it's like with figures. Over here, we all about seeing the everyday American consumer do better and be better. My name is Major Wala. And I guess I'll holler at y'all on the next one. Peace. Peace.